Idag ska vi äntligen få besöka ett av Europas och kanske världens mest innovativa destillerier, Empirical Spirits i Köpenhamn. Till skillnad från många producenter som fokuserar på kategorier som gin, vodka, rom eller whisky till exempel så bränner Empirical Spirits baserat på en önskad smakprofil. Resultatet är flera spektakulära buteljeringar såsom The Plum I Suppose, Symphony 6, Ayuk och Sokka. Ja, alltså det är helt okategoriserade grejer och med det är inte heller regelstyrt, men det är också det som gör det här så spännande tycker jag. Idag ska vi i alla fall få träffa Rodrigo som ansvarar för produktionen av alla produkter. Han kommer att visa oss runt och visa hur deras destilleri skiljer sig från de andra och till slut så kommer han ta med oss på en provning som tillhör en av de mest unika jag har varit på, mitt i destilleriet. Avsnittet är på engelska ska tilläggas men självklart så finns det då undertexter för den som önskar. Och med det sagt, välkomna till Köpenhamn och Empirical Spirits. Okej okay, Rodrigo, how, how would you describe what you do here at uh, Empirical? Um, so essentially what we try to do, we call ourselves a flavor company. Mm. And I think that's worth explaining a little bit what a flavor company is. Um, essentially when you have like all these nuances of like experiences that you have maybe with a specific ingredient or a place. Uh, what we try to do is to put them inside a bottle. Alcohol is a great medium to not only extract flavor but also to preserve it. Um, so we're a flavor company. So in terms of uh, producing a, a liquid, uh, alcohol-based liquid, yeah. you need a raw ingredient. Yeah. What raw ingredients do you work with? So essentially like for our core products, um, some of them we are, are grain based, mm. right? They're not necessarily needs to be always based on the grain, but um, here in this facility we have, um, they're mostly uh, pearl barley, mm. which is uh, a polished barley. We're gonna talk about koji in a second. Can you guys see that? We have Pilsner Mon, mm. which is very common in brewing. So a lot of people know that. This is just like a simple uh, a malt. Uh, we have purple wheat, which is like a local um, type of like wheat in the northern northern Europe, and obviously uh, we have like different uh, other like uh, soca, for instance, that is one of our products is based on sorghum juice. We're gonna get there uh, when you're gonna be tasting, but like um, ultimately for the grain part of it, we use barley and wheat mm. with the variations of it. Everything starts here. Obviously, you get uh, the ingredient to your exactly. Uh, facility. Exactly. So we bring bring like bring the grains over. We worked for a very long time with a partner in Denmark. Uh, so the farmer uh, was able to obviously give us like the exactly uh, the exact type of um, barley that we wanted, mm. um, and and obviously they are all organic, and uh, we brought it over, put it in here. And these are the silos, right? They're all transferred like either for koji making mm. or straight to brewing. And essentially what we want from this is just like obviously the, the flavor that these uh, grains provide, but also the sugary enzymes that will help us make alcohol later. You would say that the, the fermentation process is really important for uh, the end result. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because, well, you have several layers of fermentation, right? Koji is a way of like the, the, the mode is like somehow fermenting that, right? Mm. It's a solid state fermentation. But um, you also have the yeast fermentation afterwards, which will give us the alcohol and will also produce a lot of compounds, mm. right? And then um, th those are like new, like those are compounds that are created during the process that has a huge impact on when we're distilling it. Distillation doesn't really create anything. It just separates and concentrates it. Mm. And it's up to us to choose those parts afterwards. When we're gonna be like going through the distilling room details, you will be able to see like what we're talking about fractioning and, and blending. So that's, that's different, a different story. But ultimately the flavors are coming from the grain and from the fermentation process that those grains or whatever you're using, in case of Oud de Vie, for instance, you're using a fruit, right? Um, it goes through fermentation and those flavors are created for then during distillation we were able to extract it. Right. Shall we go and have a look at the Koji Let's room? Let's go have a look at the Koji room. Would you say that the Koji room is something that uh, sort of adds the empirical flavor to your product? So why did you, um, so first of all, why did you use to work with Koji? Yeah, well, so like I would say yes 
and no. There's something that is a kind of a, like a, lo a lot of our, our products in the beginning were very much Koji based. Mm. Um, it is a flavor that we really appreciate. We appreciate the technique. We, we use that quite a bit. But we cannot let that just be a limitation, right? Because once you just fix one thing, you ignore all the rest. Mm. So we see Koji as a, a technique and an opportunity to explore and deliver flavor. The same as like malting, the same as using fermentation in fruits, the same as a lacto ferment. Like it's just a technique which we appreciate a lot. But like uh, some of our products are like at this point in time, most of our products not necessarily have coach in it. All right. Right. Uh, but some of them have, and then it's also important. Again, if we think about like flavor, you, and that's something that it was always a question for us is when you start to get too fixed on it has to be that way or otherwise is not right, um, which is very common to see in our industry. Um, you're ignoring so many other possibilities, yeah. right? So the moment that we say like all our products that have to have koji, then we're not like doing for the flavor anymore. No, exactly. Then we are just like no doing just because it has to be. No, we, so we need to embrace all these differences yeah. and be able to use them in our favor to develop like interesting. You don't want things. to limit yourself. Uh, Not at all. You know. And then that's the thing, right? Everything that we created here, it was trying to do the opposite, yeah. right? Sometimes it's not even the most efficient way of doing it, but definitely allows us to be very flexible. And with flexibility, we can be creative. And then we can come up with things that are like not as commonly see uh, in, the, in the distilling industry or the spirits industry. When we were talking about koji, right? So like, well, what, what's koji then? Let's just start with that. Yeah. So this is how kind of like koji looks like. Obviously it is a little bit more dry because I'm here just show you an example. But essentially when you get your grain and you grow mold on it, it becomes this like little cake. Yeah. The white part of it is the mold growing in the grain. Mm. So here right now you're creating flavor and enzymes on the process of koji in the grain, right? So essentially what we did here is just like you cook the grains, right? And once it's cooked, you regulate the temperature and the moisture, mm. and then you inoculate, you sprinkle the, 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 the spores of, of, of Aspergillus orze, and then it's a very labor intensive process, and it takes about like 36 to 40 hours mm. to have it ready. When it's ready, that's what you see. This is the the koji, cake. the koji cake. And that is what you do here in your And that's room. what it happens inside this room, right? So you still look like the sauna. It stays at like 40 degrees Celsius inside. Yeah. It's very like um, high in humidity. So you're talking about 70, 80% humidity mm. inside. Um, obviously when we're bringing the grains in, uh, it's even hotter than that. So obviously you have ventilation and you have like the labor of mixing it. Uh, to control all that and to prep the grains in a way that the mold can uh, grow in an optimal environment. And then obviously, depending on how you control temperature or like the variables of it, you're gonna have different outcomes in terms of flavor or enzymes. So that's why you have to control to be able to make koji, right? You can make on a small box if you want to, mm. but the more, the bigger you get, like the harder it is to control those, those those variables. This is pearl barley, right? Mm. So this is before you, that's you're probably familiar with. Mm. You see that it's very polished and it's like very small compared to, so that's being polished like 60, 70% of it out. Right. So this is like what it goes in there. Above the koji root. Exactly, that is a butter churner from the 70s. All right. Yeah, so we essentially, when we were cooking on like an oven, it was kind of easy, right? But when you're talking about cooking 300 kilos, 350 kilos, <laughs> right? Twice a week, uh, it's a different kind of volume. I can imagine. So we needed to find a way to do it, right? And then Lars found that um, butter churner and we decided to actually hack it. So essentially we feed and then we fill it up with water and then we rinse the grains, we soak the grains inside and there's a uh, steam injection on the right hand side here, which cooks the grain there as well. Mm. So you're doing all those stages inside the big drum. And once it's done, we just 
drop them all inside the Koji room oh, from you a use hole the gravity. in it. Yes. So essentially, what we do, we just mix with water, and then it goes through a brewing process, right? Saccharification, controlled temperature, as you were brewing beer. The fact that we're using koji sometimes, uh, it makes the standard process of brewing very different. Because at some point, you need to separate the liquid from the solids, mm. right? And then that separation can become like the pretty tricky. Uh, what is that? Well, it becomes a slush, just almost like a porridge, yeah. right? Standard brewing have something called Lauderton, which is essentially you have like a screen and you pour all the, your grains over there, the liquid pass through, and then you just flush water on top. If we do that, you're gonna see that it's gonna clog and become like a, 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 a solid, like mud almost, yeah. right? And the water is not gonna go through. So they're just production challenges, right? So the way we did it was like, we actually added our uh, mesh filter mm -hmm. to our process. Um, the mesh filter is like uh, very flexible and allow us to almost slice and put like smaller quantities of that uh, wort. Uh, and when you separate that way, you can actually have a very efficient uh, recovery and extraction of, of your brew, right? Mm -hmm. Of your mesh. Um, and that means that you are able to use koji at any quantity that we want, so as using any kind of grain. So again, that allows us to be very creative on the grain bills or the type of grains that we're using in our products, mm. right? So everything is cooked over there, transferred, separated, all the solids, they either go to cattle feeding or we can just repurpose them and like make or even shoyus or misos with like the spent. And then afterwards we recollect it cool it down, and then that's ready for the yeast. Cooking on this one, yeah. separation of solids up there, yeah, exactly. Right, right. Then we recollect the liquid over there. Yeah. That's gonna be hot. And then we're gonna transfer to these vessels. So if we come- Are right the here, tall ones right here? Well, you could, both tall ones, but like ultimately, I think this is like a, so these are the fermentation vessels. This is obviously a quite important step. Yeah. Uh, you ferment here. Exactly. Yeah. So then you have now that sweet must, yes. right? So like the sweet wort, f like full of flavor, um, and it's time to ferment to actually have alcohol. Yeah. Right? That's when yeast comes on board. We work very close to White Labs. Uh, White Labs is one of the biggest um, yeast companies in the world. They, they are from uh, San Diego, California. And uh, obviously, uh, they have like a Copenhagen base, uh, had um, uh, one of their, their, their units are here. So like you have the hybrid, um, the beer, right? That we call wash in mm -hmm. distilling. Uh, have that beer sometimes as koji, which is this like hybrid sake beer kind of. And it's sitting like at like 9% ABV. It's time to collect all that flavor and all the alcohol, right? Mm. The way we do it, it's like we distill in the two stages. We have something called stripping run, which is strips the alcohol out. It's the first distillation, yeah. right? Um, and then you have a second distillation afterwards when you add like your botanicals and then you redistill it, mm. right? So let's separate that. The first distillation is, if you think about standard distillation, right? Or atmosphere as we call it, atmosphere distillation. You, the way it works, you just add heat, right? And then that creates energy, evaporates, and then you condensate and you collect it, right? Now, let me put the perspective of cooking on that. Mm. But let's say you're, you're cooking, right? When you are cooking and you have heat applied to it, you're transforming the flavors, yes. right? Yeah. So for the good, for the bad, right? It becomes something else. Mm. So the way we do it, like when you're boiling water and you're boiling water at like a sea level, you are gonna boil water at 100 degrees Celsius. Right? Mm -hmm. um, let's say that we don't want, for example, to, we don't want the heat to transform the flavors. So how do you do that? How, how can you like avoid the transformation of flavors by heat? So the way we approached to it was, well, if we can't apply heat, you just go back to the story of the water, which is like if water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level, um, and you don't want to, you just have two variables there. One is pressure, 
and one is temperature. Mm. So instead of like playing with the temperature, we are going to start playing with the pressure. So vacuum. So vacuum. Yeah. Right? So that's what we do here. So all these tools that you see here, they were designed and put, put together by ourselves. Um, they are all under like very strong vacuum. So we get like the vessels that we pull a very strong vacuum, uh, which means or it allows us to evaporate those compounds at a very low temperature. So sometimes we're distilling at 12, 15, 16 degrees Celsius. Oh, so it's a huge pressure inside. Yeah. So it's a huge vacuum, exactly. Yeah. So that's the way we define to approach and to preserve all the layers of flavors that, we, that, that we've been creating at this point, mm. right? Or, or for the ingredients that we, we actually use for, for our, as our botanicals. So first stage, we just do a first distillation. We have our own low wine, as we call it, in distilling. Then you just macerate things, redistill again. And when you start distilling, the idea is just every, because of the different molecular weights, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the compounds are evaporating at different times, right? And if they're evaporating at different times and we're condensating them in different times, mm -hmm. you're able to separate them in, over like a timeline, mm -hmm. right? So, which means that when, let's say, uh, let's get like, um, a habanero as a flavor, yeah. right? Habanero as a flavor, uh, the habanero chili, it doesn't, it's not on one thing. It has red fruit, green melon, um, bell pepper. Those are all flavors that together create what like a habanero tastes like. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. So that's like same for a strawberry. Strawberry has like a huge amount of like different flavors mm. together in certain quantities that defines what we call a strawberry. However, if you're distilling it and those compounds are like fraction, mm. you are able to have them in different vessels. The vessels that you're looking at here, the buckets, the small ones, oh. the five liter growlers, right. they are all different fractions or like moments in time from the distillation that we're doing. So we fill them and then like each one of those have a specific flavor from, that, from those ingredients, from the distillation, from like, sorry, from the fermentation, from, um, from the botanicals. So which means that after fractioning them all, we've been preserving, distilling under vacuum, collecting them. So you can have like almost like a, like a, 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 a wide range of flavor colors, if you say, mm. right? Think about like a painting. You have all that amount of colors in front of you. Then it's up to you to pick them and choose which one you want to use it. So this is your color palette. That's the palette. Yeah, exactly. So you blend these flavors for yes. your end products. Exactly, yep. exactly. And that's the work of like Freddie, which is leading the distilling room, like working with Maeve. So like we have people in the team that are constantly blending that. And then it takes a lot of time to learn that specific skill or to at least be able to create the, the, the flavors that we want, mm. right? Um, and what is interesting about it is just like, I can tell you that depending on what you're distilling, imagine that like, remember when I was talking about the habanero? Mm. If there's green melon flavor in there, it means there's like some of these fractions, they have a melon flavor. Mm. So I would potentially be able to create a melon flavor spirit mm. using a ingredient that is not a melon. That's a huge rotovap. Yeah, so do you wanna come by? Like, so I've seen the small like tabletop, robot, which is that so. one, right? Yeah, like this one. Yes. Exactly. So yes. here is like where all the testing happens. So for flavored test, we use a three liters, right? Yeah. In an afternoon, we can have a lot of flavors lined up mm. and then start playing with them. Once that's done, we can do like a little bit bigger test on a bigger road of app. This is 25 liters, yeah. right? Mm. So then we distilled from here. And then after that, we can just do like, well, you should do a run on diesel. Mm. with 100 liters. Once that's all set, we go for the big guns. Mm. So we have like still there like 3,000 liters, 1,500 liters, 500 liters, different sizes. I can imagine that, that it goes so much testing into your products because you sort of creating a new path and that usually takes a lot of time. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and well, 99% of the time it's failure. So it's very frustrating, yeah. right? Because you're constantly trying, 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 trying. And sometimes after a lot of work, 
one of them pops up and yeah. you're just like, okay. Yeah, and so you want to way. make sure that that uh, single percent is so good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So like, that's what it is about. So you have to, like a lot of people ask us like, oh yeah, what's our creative process? And we're just like, wow, the creative process is just like failing a lot. You yeah, good fail insight, a lot, I guess, yes. right? It's that's it. You just go and go and go and go, and you play and fail, 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 fail. But you can hear the sound of a good idea clicking when it happens. The interesting part here is that all this combined failure or uh, the great flavors that you come up with uh, is learnings leading towards Absolutely. your products that you end up with. Like everything that you have done leads us to the, uh, those products. Absolutely. Uh, that Absolutely. is, uh, I guess, uh, an achievement, really. Yeah. I must say. Whoa, talking about products. Shall we go try some no, of them I now? Can't, I can't wait. Yeah, let's do it. Yes. After a lot of work, we're, like, it took us like, well, six years now to kind of fine tune and deal, the, to finally decide what would be our core products. Mm. So right now we have four core products. Two of them, they've been in the market for a, a while. And uh, two of them, they've got recently launched in Europe. Mm. Um, and I want to show you like how to like like the peculiarity of each one, and that's like somehow also tells a little bit of the story about empirical, but in a liquid form, mm. right? So first things first. Let's start with Plum. Okay, so let me get you this one. This the name of this one is Plum, I suppose, right? It's a. I really like how. Uh, how it does um, represents the idea of disconstructing uh, a category, mm. right? That's a, that's a good example of like preconceptions that are not necessarily like why we do things, like why the people are being doing like that all the time and we just did it, right? So it just starts with the uncategorization of what we're doing. Mm. So essentially this is plum kernels that are crushed, infused in alcohol and distilled. Mm. Don't have. Don't worry about the any dangerous compound on it. It's like. Do, do you use the whole fruit here? No. Nope. No. Just the stone. Just the stone. Yes. So if you look like this, ah, this is what it is. Yeah, right? because it's uh, on the nose. It's a mm. little bit like amaretto. It's marzipani, oh. right? Yeah. So you have like. So the idea here is just you, we use marigold. And, um, and plum. So both mm. are infused in alcohol separately, distilled. So you have like the plum spirit, which is very marzipani on the nose, like mm. the white. Really, yeah. Then you have the marigold, which is infused and distilled as well. Whatever is left from the marigold, we make a kombucha mm. out of it. Mm. And then we distill the kombucha. You do that as well? Yeah. So Never heard about that. So either. Exactly. But like the, that's the whole point about like, we were talking about uh, ABV and why that's important, right? So how it usually works, you distill it, we have a high ABV coming out of the still, and then we water it down, Yeah. right? Let me tell you a story about like a different perspective on this. If you're cooking and you're making a sauce and that sauce is too thick, mm. depending on the sauce, there's two ways to approach that. You add water to it and you think that makes it like thinner. Um, sometimes it's good, but you're also diluting flavor in that sense. Or you can add stock, hmm. a chicken stock or a veggie stock to it, which you're also diluting, but you're creating a new layer of flavor on that. So the question is, why do you have to use water to bring the, the ABV down of your spirit? And if we distill acetic acid then, which is the mole molecule is very similar, it's possible to distill it, and then use that like flavored acidic water to bring the, the distill it down. Mm. So that's what we do here. So we distill kombucha, we have three components, right? So you have the plum spirit, the marigold, the marigold profile will give a very much like a, the flash, that like fruit, f f f um, the flash of the fruit. And, uh, uh, and then you have like an end, like a rounded acidity that is coming from the distilled kombucha mm. and it's sitting at 32%. 32. Yes. Amazing. I mean, I'm waiting for it in a way to be sweet because the flavors is so like yeah. big and round, yep. but it's not sweet. This is like a, a really dry spirit. Yeah. But with sort of sweet 
flavors, if Ex that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's again, right? That's that's one of the challenges that um, we have all the time because you, I, I can explain to people so much, and then the entire team is constantly going through. Oh, what is it? Why is that? Like, how is that a gin? It's like no. So it's not. There's like it's uncategorized. A, mm. B. Uh, it's it's nothing difficult to relate to. Can you exp can you tell me what you like any spirit that you? No, it's not even close to anything I ever tried. So yeah. so how do you use words only to explain that? So that's why when you taste it and you're just like okay, mm. so now you see what I meant, mm. right? It makes so much sense. Yeah, I can imagine that people get confused because classics demands for different kind of uh, base spirits, for instance, but. It makes so much sense to just try it. What does it taste? Okay. How, what can I? What kind of a cocktail can I work? Uh, with we this? do a lot of twists on classics just to shake that a little bit. Yeah. So think about like, uh, like we do that like a plum tini. Yeah. Right. So that's a that's a way to to do this. Like we did like back in the day, we can do like a negroni with plum. Yeah. I, I you, can imagine so many drinks work with this. Like I mean this would be a really good base spirit in any a drink. Of, yeah, yeah, a lot of different drink. cocktails. And I think it's uh, very clever how you work also with the flavor profile in the back of the bottle here. I'm not sure if you can see that in the, in the camera there, but that's also good for the consumers also to understand the products exactly. that they've never seen or tried before. Exactly, to give a nuance and then again, it's fun because like the words that we're using there, they're not like to describe it. They're not necessarily like, that's how we internally describe the flavor yeah right so that's what we were bringing on the on 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 those wheels let's go to soca what is that so soca right so soca is recently launched um the challenge here was actually to try to find a spirit that is not necessarily grain based mm. right so soca is a, a product that is um, made out of sorghum this might say like, okay, sorghum has been used before, that, uh, but we're not talking, a, uh, talking about the sorghum uh, grain. No. We're talking about the sorghum juice from the cane. This is, for example, where we press it to get the juice from. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So like we're very used to this, right? This is the grains. So what is, what is this? It's like, uh, I don't... It's, a, so, sure it's, called, it's a, called sweet sorghum. Sweet sorghum. Yeah. How yeah. is that used uh, besides in your product? Essentially, like sorghum, it's uh, used as a regenerative crop. Mm -hmm. So it retains a lot of nitrogen in the soil, but it's not as, for a lot of farmers. There is just like not necessarily a a, a, a use for it. Mm. So the the deal here was to actually get something that is just giving a new use for something that the farm see no added value to it. Um, we partner up with like, obviously this is specific sorghum. It's a, there's a few farmers in the US that they've been doing this for like their entire life. Mm. So it's very like, it's a, it's a very building to their culture, but it's like very rare to find it. Mm. And they, they cultivate this type of sorghum and they make syrup out of it. So they just get the juice, they cook down, and it becomes like a syrup that you can use as a sweetener, right? And then we, like, they helped us like a lot. We have a very good relationship with, uh, with the farmers. And what we do with Soka is we get the juice. It's a crazy, I think that's a, that's a whole new video just to talk about Soka, to be honest with you, because mm. um, you, like we're harvesting and juicing in, uh, at the same time. So that happens in the fields. Mm. And that juice we fermented, part of that juice is changed into syrup, which we after ferment the syrup, and then we distill them with them like, like our partners in the US. Right? right. One is in, the, uh, uh, in uh, Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, and the other one is in California. Um, you can like find that like on our website and like the, we have like the whole story there. But ultimately this is like the flavor of the like the heartland, right? It's just like it's the field. If you get like the, the, the flavor of like a sorghum field in the in the middle of US uh, in the, and then just pack it into a bottle.
that's that's what you were talking about here. That is soca. That's soca, right? So it's it has a little bit of like um, an agricole sort of, but like not really that funky, but it's still yeah, like silage, like brine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, briny. Again, I thought I had something to say that would describe it. I can't, I can't rarely, uh, it's hard to describe. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's such a, a rare taste here. I mean, not even rare, it's unique. I'm not sure if there's anything close to this even. I mean, Probably. some no. kind of an agricole rum in a way, but still, it's more like green in the nose. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's again, right? So like, it's touching different points, it's just repurposing a... Um, an ingredient, mm. right? It's trying to capture capture um, specific aspects of it. It's finding like um, a different news and ultimately representing the landscape, but just that in 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 the liquid form. Mm. This is so impressive. Uh, Thank it, you. Sometimes it can be a cool idea to create something, uh, but the taste can be, you know. Quite good sometimes, mm -hmm. not not even good at all uh, other times. But this idea is really unique, and the flavor is, I mean, even better. I think you know, so it's very well calibrated. I really like it. Yeah, and thank you. We are very proud of like. Again, we spoke about failure before, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of failures to get to the point that we're proud to yeah. actually bring bring to the market. It's a bit like if you combine the fruitiness from a pisco, sort of. Mm -hmm. And then the rom style claren, like this raw rom uh, feel to it. I think it's really good. I, I, I would really love to try this in something like a caprinia, for instance. Yeah. Imagine that. That yeah, would work I well. Do. Yeah. I do. Well, I mean, I'm not going to say anything. I've, I've done it already, right? As a Brazilian, that's yeah. something for me that is. So, yeah, it comes down with, like, especially with some types of cachaça, they. Side story on this one, we played like right now we are using a Thai rice chong yeast to ferment. Mm. The, but we also did a few um, versions using a kashas yeast. Mm. And then we end up like deciding to go this right because it, it suited like really well. Mm. But you're right about saying that it's just, it just navigates that world in terms of like flavor profile. Mm. And I mean, completely different to, to this. So if you would describe this as a category, it would be impossible. Impossible, yeah, right? Yeah. Impossible. Well, so let's go even further now, yeah. right? Let's go to a different space. That's Symphony 6. And what is that? So if I have to put in short, is, is imagine the world of perfume mm. and the world of spirits merged together. Okay. So here we have several leaves. So we are talking about citrus leaves, we're talking about coffee leaf, we're mm. talking about fig leaf, right? That they're all being distilled and that becomes the base, the structure, the spirit of it, right? Mm. That being said, we also have ingredients that are very uncommon in distilling, but very commonly find in the perfume industry. So you have blackcurrant buds, umbrat, seeds, uh, vetiver, which are infused, right? Mm. And together blended to make this uh, like summery, very fresh, like spritzy like spirit, mm. right? So this is like recently launched it. Um, and I think it's just like, it's such, such, such an interesting flavor. Where and, does uh, uh, the color come from? So the color is like, it comes from like some infusions. Mm. So we infuse and then some of them were do not distill it. We just make the infusion, gives a little bit of color, and then we calibrate afterwards with a little bit of like a carmine, which is like an insect. Mm. Okay, well, that's a color that comes from continue, mm. like as an insect. Yeah. So we just did a little touch of that. It's just almost like nothing, just to give this peach color to it. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the link to the perfume here. It's the aromatic uh, side of the spirit is very intense and fruity. Yeah, and then you have like the very like green flavor. It's very floral, mm. you know? Imagine like that, for example, on a spritz. Yeah, I can do that. I can imagine that. 
think I need to read on the Thank label you. here to sort of so, to find the, the different flavors. Aromatic grass, soft wood, watermelon candy. Yeah, watermelon. Yeah. That is something that yeah. really comes. Yeah. It's you know this small, it's, it says watermelon candy. I'm thinking about this small, like pink, sugary yeah. candy pieces. Yeah, exactly. Is that what you refer to almost yeah. here? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, if that could be, you know, a spirit in itself, that would be this. But so much more to it as well. Yeah, there's like, you see, so when we are discussing flavor internally, mm. we always see as a journey, right? Lars explained that really well when we talk about like, okay, so which part of the story we're in, right? We're discussing. So you have like the first, the way I describe it is just like I, I divide it in fours, the first 25%, then another 25%. So which part of the journey flavor we're at, mm. right? So, and that's when we're just like, oh, the middle is missing. It's like, it's not ending well, or we need a little bit better, like up front, like on the nose. So, and then we start to like fill those gaps with what we believe would be like a flavor journey when you sip it, mm. right? So that's, what did. that's when you just have like the spice and a little bit of the wood, but then you have a watermelon candy. And those things is just like very, all of them are very floral and sweet and nice. It's so the intersection between a spirit and a perfume. Mm. And I also think it adds value to the experience here, not drinking everything from a stemmed glass, for instance. Like we have different sort of, uh, yeah, what to call them even, cups, uh, different shapes, different uh, well, materials. Well, yes, like. we worked with different ceramists yeah. that they actually made our glassware uh, related to, to our products. So I like they were that. like very, very thoughtful. Uh -huh. um, yeah, because that adds to the flavor experience as well. Like, yeah. That, Shall yeah. we go to another world again? Yes. Okay. So Ayuk, is that the name? Here? That's the name. Yeah. That's the name. So Ayuk essentially is like um, um, this. It's, it's kind of like this story that comes from uh, Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. So it's like some mountains close to, to Oaxaca. And um, it's essentially this chili that is grown at a different altitudes. Um, and then they do too, like they do like the Mihe people, they are very proud of that. And that's essentially for a while, uh, just seen as a commodity. Mm. And that's something that we wanted to showcase because it's a very special flavor. Lars was there visiting and then he brought that back and we started playing with that. The distillage was absolutely amazing. And then we figure out like partners and then talk to the farmers. And then we have a very good relationship with them. And then we try to like get like straight to the farmers. We went visit them. And um, ultimately what we're doing is just like, we're like, there's a huge story like that they call the coyotes, which is essentially people that get there and know that they don't know, they don't have the, they have a problem to sell it. So they pay very low prices for the chilies and uh, they resell it on markets at a very much higher price. So what we were doing, we were just going straight to the farmers and paying consumer prices for them mm. and then helping them have market prices so they can actually have a better income related to that. Uh, beautiful product, we mill it, distill it, and then you have like that sharp, smoky barbecue campfire taste, which afterwards we, but it's a clear spirit. Then afterwards, we rest it in uh, Oloroso casks from Spain. Oh. Right? And nice. then it rounds it out. To get sort so, of the nuttiness or? To get the sweetness that it rounds out that smoke a little bit, right? It's a little bit on the strong side, 43%. Um, These cups? Yes, please. Yeah. Mm. 43%? Yeah. And um, I would say that, like, again, it's, it's if you. If you need to give like an idea of a flavor, it's almost like if a, a whiskey and a mezcal had a, had a child. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's neither of them. Yeah. I, I, I read on the label like sweet barbecue, red fruit, grilled pepper, raisins, toasted oak. I can just imagine. Yeah. I mean, the, the mezcal sort of smokiness. Exactly. If you will. That, that is the first thing that I feel here. Exactly. And this has like this a little bit of like this vegetable pepper flavor, yeah. right? 
Oh man, this is good. This is... I mean, this is my favorite so far. Everything is so good, so interesting. But, but this is, you know, something that I would pour on a regular basis and just enjoy as it is. Yeah, but... I, I, I love mezcal, so it's really good that it reminds of that in a way. But also the richness of a good whiskey. Yeah, mm. so that's that's the thing, and and for us again go, goes back to the like being a flavor company, right? As you're saying that that was your favorite, a lot of people like plum. This is one of our like products that is like selling the most. It depends mm. on the region, depends on the soca is a huge success with Barton. So they're nothing like each other. No, right? They're ex completely different impression or expressions of like flavor and what like a spirit can be if you just free yourself and try to do something different yeah oh. i i'm a bit speechless because i mean uh, sometimes it's easy to refer to something else to talk about this but the flavors is so un unique you know and this was just so good so i, I just <laughs> feel that you know it's a perfect thing to have uh, yeah this will this will be a standard bottle if it's possible to have in uh, in my on my bar shelf like this was really something else nice and yeah. i'll tell you what you should try to make a margarita with that yeah it, it's absolutely delicious yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely delicious so let's get like like i think this is like a very interesting one um so that's a hime i think that's a, there's a story here so we're like, these are like usually our, it's a program that we have with the cask that we have here in the back. Yeah. Um, we release cask per cask. So it's every, every bottle is just one cask and that's it. Oh, so you don't blend? No. So, no. Okay. no. Mm -hmm. So far we didn't, mm -hmm. right? If we, we will decide to do that in the future, again. It's all about the no flavor. Rules. <laughs> no rules. No rules, <laughs> right? Good. But, but Good. so far we're trying to keep as like single casks. Yeah. Right? single casks and um, the Hime is like a while ago when we were distilling an old product called Helena we got part of that batch and we put into a ex bourbon cask and let it sit Mark and Lars was just like we're just gonna keep this to our grandsons and one day Lars and I we were just like pulling and tasting and we had like, like do you remember like the earthquake in Hime Japan mm. um, a while ago and then what happened is like he's like he has a friend over there and then there was like this project trying to raise money to to help them because of that and um we tasted it and then we decided to pull the cask it was 106 bottles at that time and all the proceeds went to help them mm. and then by that moment we tasted it there was been in the cask for about nine months and we were just like oh this is delicious mm. right maybe we should do it again and that's when the, the project started. So it's been sitting for a very long time. We have several casks. Um, each cask has its own expression of time that it, they've been in. They're like different types of grain bill, different types of wood. So we have like all that. Um, we released cask one, two, and three so far. Uh, there's more casks that are like, we know that are ready and some that is gonna take a while to. Um, we, this is like a bottle that was designed uh, by ourselves and um, the cask number one we work with a glass studio uh, nearby here in 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 Raffin, and we mouth blow the bottles mm. and then uh, obviously like this one for a little bit more production we, we we couldn't do it but like we did like 50 bottles that were just like we just did ourselves and um so in this case, it's like a, a, a bit like stronger is a 48%. So it's an ex bourbon uh, Koji based spirit that is being uh, sitting in a cask for two years and 11 months. <laughs> Just before whiskey. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's um, again, this sweet sort of uh, aromas that I felt from uh, the plum. I can imagine that this is not sweet at all, but I like that when that is the first thing that you, it's almost like honey, you know? Yeah, yeah. It does have like there's like this honey flavor, spice like almost like spice wood. You have a little bit of a vanilla, right? There's like all, all all flavors that you can you can grasp from it. 
Mm. And it's the amazing. idea is a series. We call it Hit Me Series now. And uh, we have, like, you can go to our web shop and then it's going to be, a, it's available there. So essentially, we want to have, like, this sequence of, like, casks so people can essentially collect them and then compare one to the other and mm. have the, the same experience that we have when we taste them. It's able to, like, we can replicate that and people can have it at home. Mm. That, is, that is also something that I think is nice, like, to be able to, to, to feel what a cask can do to a specific bottling. Like, exactly. That uh, drinks doesn't necessarily need to be the same every single time. Like, it does it, not. No. It does not. And then let me, like, for example, I'll let you try this, right? This is one of the Ahimis mm. that it hasn't been released yet. We don't really know when we're going to do it, but it's in a mulberry cask. All right. Right? We, we got this mulberry ca cask as a gift from our friends at Monkey 47. Yeah. Right? So one of, one of the casks was an ex-Monkey 47 mulberry cask, mm. and the other one was a virgin mulberry cask. And then we let it sit, we age it, and then this is like cask strength, but I think it's worth it for you. This is something that I thought it was very interesting, but like also explain a little bit and give us an idea of like what a Hemis series is actually about. How long has this been on the, the cask? Oh, that stayed for there like a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little bit like, yeah, almost three as well. Mm. This was an interesting flavor meeting, so to speak, like the woodiness from a cask and the berryness. Yeah which obviously also is from the cask, but yeah. from a different liquid. Yeah, it does feel like there has fruit in it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. yeah. This is like an eau de vie been aged on a cask almost. Like with, with, but without having like an actual fruit, right? Hmm. A yeah. lot of impressions to sort of... Yeah, um, right? So like we could go and, yeah, go and go and go yeah. and go, but, but one thing and then just like, wow, oh, this like, it's a... Sometimes like was just like one of the questions. So, so there's a few questions and challenges that we go through all the time. So like, first of all is how do I use it? Uh, the question which is like, what is it, right? So like a lot of people just, but what, what is it? Is it whiskey? Is it like, no, it's uncategorized. That's first one. Second is just how do we use it, right? So we always try to sh like give as, m as many tools as possible to ha let people play with that, mm. right? And bartenders, they've been doing a great job. We've been working with like, bastard by bartenders in the world and they been like just like coming up with like creating on top of the spirits cocktails that are like mind-blowing right but one other way that we approach it to it was actually creating a ready to drink so if this is like let's say it is an ingredient mm -hmm. that's up like a ready like a plate this three yeah yeah right so um the cans were the idea of having something that is a little bit more casual you're in the park, you're in a barbecue, you, you just open it, you drink it. They're like lower ABV, right? You can go from like 10, 8 and 4.5. But at the end of the day, you're just going to drink it and um, it still have a very, very different flavor experience. Mm. So let me give you an idea. Can 01, right? It starts at black one. This yes. one, yeah? Yeah. So this is... Um, a mix of milk long tea, mm -hmm. green gooseberries macerated in both water and alcohol separately, right? You, we have um, pine, we have pomelo, and we have birch wood. Mm. Would you say that a long tea is a, a little bit like, has a peachy note to it? Or, it does have uh, a peachy note to it. That's a very good call. It has like that very like light peach, like super sweet nose to it. Yeah, it's like the peach is very much uh, yeah. what I feel when I... Yeah. And a good carbonation as well. And then we carbonate it. the mousse. Yeah, exactly. Not these big bubbles. Yeah, and also like, but that's, that's, you see like, it's almost like a lower ABV alternative for like a sparkling wine. Yeah. Right? A little bit more on the sweeter side. No, there's no sugar in it, but... This is, you know, RTD sometimes can be a little bit... Diffu it's, it's confusing to, to talk about RTDs because some is really sweet, 
it's not too complex most of the time, but some is really great and it's more crafty. And this is more dry, I would say, than a lot of RTDs. Yeah. In a good way, which makes it more like something like a dry cider kind of, even, you know, sparkling wine, but with a very intense fruitiness. Yeah. And also, like, for us, it's also a way to showcase, like, again, the use of birch, the use of green gooseberries, mm. the mix with uh, oolong tea, right? The wild, like, pine bring to it, right? Yeah. So, like, it's a way to bring, like, these different ingredients to say, like, look, we can have an RTD that is different, mm. right? Let me, let me show you the second one. This is Can02. It's a, a favorite for a lot of people. This is like, this is like a lot of compounds um, to make this actually can. We have the sour cherries, right? That are both blended in water and alcohol. Then we have blackcurrant buds. Then we have young pine cones that are infused in kombucha, mm. right? Then we have macau pepper that gives like yeah, the berryness is really, it's like, it's a little bit like the black currants. It's like a fresh black currant almost when you sort of squeeze yeah. it between your fingers, yeah. Which is like, we have the buds, it has a very peculiar flavor. We would use black currant buds on, on Symphony 6 as well. Yeah. Mm. Dry as well, not intense exactly. sweetness, which I, in a way, I, I sort of expect it. I don't know why, because, because it's an RTD, probably. I expect it to be, you know, sweet and Overly like sweet. a soda, but yeah. in a way. But this is, I would more refer to something like a cider, a, a dry cider. I feel that is more fair, but with loads of flavors. Like the, the, the red line here is so, so much flavor in, in these bottles and, and cans. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so that's, that's what it is about, right? It's a constantly trying to explore that. And, um, yeah, I would say like the, just like the one of the last ones, that's the lightest, lightest one. This is like carob uh, fig leaf. Um, we have kimung tea, uh, mm. sorry, um, andaliman pepper and... Uh, what, is, what is carob? Carob, carob is like a little, um, it's a little, um, it's, almost, it's, it's, a, it's a type of like, let me see if I can, I can get like uh, an example for you. Oh, this is like a sour beer. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <sighs> nice. When I'm thinking about it, this could also be sort of on its way to a sour beer. In that sense that it's dry, it's packed with fruit, and it's not sweet at all. Like, just like a sour beer. And that is something that people like a lot. So I, I would say that this is, you know, in the spectra between a yeah. classic RTD drink via an apple cider or something like that and a sour beer something like that mm, really yeah good. exactly exactly it's a good way to describe it for us it's essentially like the exploration of flavor and making it like very accessible very easy to consume but it's still very interesting and challenging in terms of mm. what you're tasting right yeah like on how you can mimic and have like a very interesting flavor experience from ingredients that a lot of people never heard about mm. i really appreciate that you uh, that you don't add too much sugar, or I'm not sure even add any sugar, but that you yeah. keep them like, the flavor speaks for themselves here, together with the, the, the moussey bubbles, sort of. I really like this. But th that was 10%, 8%, something and like 4. that, 5. and 4.5. So yeah, different in intensity as well. Exactly. Well, I, I mean, really appreciate uh, having my, us here, and uh, thank you so much. My pleasure. You see, like, a lot of glasses, that's how we roll. Um, yeah. uh, please come back again, it's like, our pleasure to have it. Like also, it's always amazing. And for us, it's very important to try to bring a little bit like inside and show this is the thinking behind it. And you know, like uh, that's where a lot of people spend a lot of time uh, of their lives trying to, to bring these products to, yeah. to everybody. So I will, I will do it like this. I will list a few bars uh, in, uh, that I know in Sweden making drinks with these products so it's easy accessible. I will also see what's uh, available at Systembolaget, so that, uh, I mean, that you get the opportunity to try this, of course. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to come back. Uh, yeah. I know that you will keep some kind of facility here in Copenhagen, but also moving towards... Yes, we're going to have, like, our headquarters in, in New York. Yeah. We're going to have, like, an um, a R&D facility and, obviously, a bar. 
Um, and then in, in Copenhagen, we're looking now like the options to have a tasting room, a little R&D facility here as well. So we can actually start investigating and researching things locally mm. and also working with uh, different production partners, both in Europe and the US to uh, localize and be a little bit more um, to like make sure that like we have things close to the consumer as possible. Mm. I think that is a great idea. Yeah. Looking forward to follow that uh, journey. And uh, as always, really appreciate that you uh, watching these episodes uh, and uh, I hope that I meet you again uh, in the future. Bye. Thank you. Great. <laughs>